Fantastic Mr. Fox is easily one of my favorite movies of all time, but that wasn't always the case. After my initial viewing, which coincidentally was my first exposure to Wes Anderson's filmography, I wasn't really sure how I felt about it. Sure, I'd enjoyed the movie, and found it oddly charming, but at the same time, it felt like there was something missing from my understanding, some piece that didn't quite click. In many ways, my first encounter with Anderson's work couldn't help but feel like an anomaly among the other movies I'd seen. Whenever the famed indie director's filmography or style is discussed, one of the most overused terms that will inevitably rear its head is quirky, as in Wes Anderson's movies, his style, his creative decisions are quirky. And while I can certainly understand why people use the term, and I myself probably would have said something similar after my introduction to his movies, I don't think it quite does the man or his work justice. I know this might seem like pedantry, but to me, quirky implies a degree of randomness, of being weird simply for the sake of being weird. But a closer inspection reveals a very specific design philosophy that underlies Anderson's style. And I believe this is most evident in Fantastic Mr. Fox, which in many ways I consider to be the definitive entry of his filmography. When I first saw the movie back in the summer of 2015, with the second half of undergrad ahead of me, true adulthood lurking just around the corner beyond it, and what little remained of my adolescence rapidly vanishing into the past, I found that the film weighed surprisingly heavily on my mind, especially considering that, on the surface, it's a classic children's trickster story told with animal puppets. Upon subsequent viewings, I found myself enjoying it more and more. But not only that, I found myself taking more from the film as well. This experience would in time inspire me to watch every one of Wes's other movies. And while I don't think all of them are great, I certainly love enough of them to rank him as one of my favorite directors. But the one work of his I keep coming back to, even all these years later, is Fantastic Mr. Fox. Anderson's style is often described as having a fairy tale or storybook aesthetic, like watching a toy box come to life, or a stage play be presented as a film, or a childhood memory get reenacted years later. And while his live-action works definitely make great use of this approach, I feel his style is actually better suited to animation, and particularly stop-motion animation, where every piece of every frame is not only artificially constructed, but capable of being manipulated by hand, existing in a sort of surreal middle ground between the tactile nature of live-action filming and the illustrated or computer-rendered state of other forms of animation. If I had to choose one word to best describe this movie, and the atmosphere that permeates it, it wouldn't be quirky, though there certainly is a peculiarity to Anderson's presentation. It wouldn't be charming, though the movie undoubtedly contains a great deal of charm. And it wouldn't be melancholic, despite the film's portrayal of a midlife crisis and a longing for the carefree existence of youth, motifs common to much of Wes's work. No, the word I feel best describes Fantastic Mr. Fox is cozy. It's a movie drenched in the essence of warm nostalgic comfort of a simple life among family and neighbors who care for one another despite their differences, of the earthy smell of falling leaves and the cool breezes that herald the end of summer, of gathering inside for Thanksgiving dinner while the first hints of winter cut through the dusk. It's a movie that, despite on its surface being about heists and shootouts, feels oddly relatable, that despite primarily containing a cast of woodland creatures, is deceptively human, that despite being appropriate for all ages, is oddly vulnerable and mature, and that despite being thoroughly cloaked in nostalgic trappings, has something surprising, and I believe fairly profound as well, to say about how we view the past. And so today, in the spirit of the holiday, I'd like to give thanks for Fantastic Mr. Fox. At first glance, Roald Dahl's 1970 children's book might seem like an odd choice for a feature-length adaptation especially by someone as devoted to melancholic character studies as Wes Anderson. Clocking in at just under 10,000 words, both the story and its cast are extremely simple. The cunning and self-assured Mr. Fox lives with his wife and four children, providing for his family by stealing livestock and produce from three cartoonishly grotesque local farmers. When the trio become fed up with his continuing thefts, they attempt to shoot Mr. Fox before trying to dig his family out of their den, and after these plans fail, the three farmers call in their numerous employees for a siege, 
hoping to starve the foxes out. However, unbeknownst to them, Mr. Fox and his wild neighbors managed to tunnel beneath their encampment and into their farms, supplying themselves indefinitely as the unwitting farmers and their henchmen wait futilely above ground for the animals to give up. It's a very simple story with very simple characters intended for very young audiences. The animals are good, the farmers are bad, Mr. Fox is a charming, confident trickster, and his family and friends both rely on and celebrate his talents. End of story. But from the opening scene of his animated adaptation, Wes Anderson makes it clear that he intends to do far more with the source material. After a brief credit sequence, on which Dahl's children's rhyme about the three farmers is shown over a backdrop of fields ripe for the harvest, we open on a shot of an apple tree silhouetted against an autumn sky. Our protagonist, Mr. Fox, stands atop a hill as the Ballad of Davy Crockett, a classic of folk Americana, plays softly from his Walkman. Mr. Fox, voiced by George Clooney, takes a moment to sample an apple as he awaits his wife, Mrs. Fox, herself voiced by Meryl Streep, before viewers are treated to a bit of quick-witted dialogue courtesy of Wes and co-writer Noah Baumbach. We take the shortcut or the scenic route? Let's take the shortcut. Oh, but the scenic route is so much prettier. Okay, let's take the scenic route. Great. It's actually slightly quicker anyway. Almost immediately, the film manages to establish the core traits of Mr. and Mrs. Fox, and the dynamic between them, with only a handful of lines. The former is confident and daring, willing to take risks, reveling in his fox-like nature, while the latter is prone to caution, seeming nervous about her husband's cocksure approach. We then launch into a classic motif of western folktales, that of the wily trickster fox stealing from a farm, but with a slight twist. Rather than making a clean getaway, the two find themselves trapped when an overconfident Mr. Fox, hoping to further humiliate the farmers he has already stolen from, makes a miscalculation. This little gadget probably triggers the- What? Move out of the way, darling. Get... That's right where it's gonna land. Don't. Let's go. <laughs> Mrs. Fox then reveals that she is pregnant, and as the two hear the local farmers readying their guns and loosing their dogs, she makes her husband promise that he will abandon his life as a thief, if they survive. With this opening, Anderson draws a fairly firm line between the source material and his own film, but I'd like to hold off on discussing that for just a moment, seeing as how the next scene solidifies his adaptation's distinctive nature. The movie then cuts to 12 Fox years later, a humorous little touch, where we witness an ordinary morning in the Fox family household. Aside from the trio being animals, and the comically bestial way in which Mr. Fox devours his breakfast, there is something distinctly human about Wes's portrayal of his characters, something so familiarly domestic. Mr. Fox reads the newspaper as he prepares for the workday, Mrs. Fox makes breakfast for her husband, and their son Ash gets ready for school grumbling in the way kids often do, and even making a feeble attempt to fake sick. By this point in the movie, Wes Anderson has made it abundantly clear that, while certainly remaining reverent of Dahl's original novel, he is aiming to tell a very different story, and that despite being appropriate for children, this is going to be far more than a mere children's movie. I don't want to live in a hole anymore. It makes me feel poor. We are poor, but we're happy. Come see, come sa. Anyway, the views are better above ground. The evidence isn't just in the witty, fast-paced dialogue or Mr. Fox's use of a French phrase. It's in the more significant structural changes made from the source material, particularly in the complexities Anderson and Baumbach introduce into the cast. In the novel, Mr. Fox was a confident, widely loved, eminently successful trickster. But here, while he retains his charm and a degree of skill, it masks a layer of insecurity about his place in the world of his longing for the glory days of his youth and resenting his current domesticated status, of yearning to once more embrace his quote-unquote true nature as a quote-unquote wild animal. And George Clooney delivers a fantastic performance to match this alternative Mr. Fox, his gruff voice charming and dignified and superficially confident, yet surprisingly vulnerable when it needs to be, that of a middle-class father frustrated and feeling trapped in a malaise of normalcy. Does anybody actually read my column? Do your friends ever talk about it? May I ask what you do for a living, Mr. Fox? I used to steal birds, but now I'm a newspaper man. Oh, sure, I've seen your byline. Mm. <laughs> Likewise, the doting, unequivocally supportive Mrs. Fox of the novella becomes a cautious civilizing influence on her husband, encouraging Mr. Fox to tame his wild nature, abandon his trickster past, 
and instead turn his attention to supporting their family rather than endangering them. Lastly, the four generic, nondescript fox children from Dahl's book are replaced with Ash, a troubled, brooding, insecure only child who simultaneously looks up to his famous father and resents the distance between them, distance which primarily exists because he fails to live up to his dad's inflated expectations of what a young boy should be. In this one scene, the internal conflict within the Fox family is shown to the audience quite clearly. Mr. and Mrs. Fox will clash over the former's longing to reclaim the glory days, which the latter sees as reckless and immature, while Mr. Fox and his son Ash will struggle to connect over the latter's failure to fill his father's shoes in the particular way Mr. Fox expects him to. Even Ash's later tensions with his cousin Christofferson, which play into the second conflict, are alluded to here in the boy's resentment over having to share a room when his cousin comes to visit. And all of this is established with remarkable efficiency in the first six minutes of the movie. Every single line here manages to both make sense as mundane conversation and simultaneously be relevant to the overarching story. Mr. Fox's doubts as to whether people read his newspaper column, his reference to approaching the age at which his own father died, and his desire for a standard of living that doesn't make him feel poor, all point to general insecurities about a perceived alienation from his true nature as a wild animal. Mrs. Fox pushes back on her husband's dour observations, responding to his remark about not wanting to live in a hole in the ground with, we are poor, but we're happy. In other words, things may not be perfect, but it's important to be thankful for what we have. Similarly, Ash's grumbling about not wanting to go to school hints at his struggles fitting in and finding acceptance, and his father's dismissive attitude toward Ash's chosen outfit, an amateur recreation of the comic book hero the boy idolizes, is a microcosm of their strained relationship. Ultimately, I think that the crux of this story can be summed up in a single statement. By unduly looking to his past, Mr. Fox is neglecting his present and endangering his future. It is often remarked upon that this movie is, at its core, about the titular character's midlife crisis. And while this observation is certainly true, I think Wes uses this plot device to explore and say far more than the film's whimsical, charming veneer might suggest. But before we move on to the next scene, I'd like to discuss the technical aspects of this film, and how they contribute to that overall coziness I described in the beginning. Right from the opening, we are doused in charming rustic comfort, from the plucky banjo notes to the idyllic rural scenery, and from the folksy catalogue of the Fox family's music, including the sun-soaked harmonies of the Beach Boys and the soft, romantic love from Disney's Robin Hood, to featuring one of the archetypal motifs of Western storytelling, a trickster fox stealing from a farmer. Alexandre Desplat's beautiful score wonderfully weaves its way through every single scene, utilizing a mix of classical strings, banjos, horns, and glockenspiels to convey an innocence and charm distinctly befitting a Roald Dahl adaptation, and brilliantly complementing the overall tone. The impeccable attention to detail and expressiveness in the design of the puppets, costumes, and sets is benefited immensely by the unique voice acting techniques employed in the recording process, by which actors would frequently record together, and in environments matching those of the scenes they were recording for, something quite atypical in the world of animation, where each voice actor usually records their lines alone in a sound booth. As Wes himself recalls in an interview featured in The Making of Fantastic Mr. Fox, First, I thought it would be nice if we could have our cast together and to try to make it a fun experience recording the voices, and that it might be nice if it sounded like when you were outside, that you were really outside. I mean, if we just did it for real. If for a scene in the forest, we recorded the scene in the forest. And if we're going to set a scene by a river, we'll go over by a river. And if we're meant to be in an underground tunnel, we'll do it in somebody's basement. And that was sort of the way we recorded it. And above all else, this is a film deeply rooted in the aesthetic of autumn, a season often associated with wistful reflection on the past as the year winds down, whose color palette of inviting reds and oranges and earthy browns naturally evokes a sense of simplistic comfort, and whose mild chill and gentle winds, at least in much of the northern hemisphere, strike a comforting middle ground between the blazing heat of summer and the bitter cold of winter. But despite being so thoroughly saturated with nostalgic coziness, I believe that Anderson intentionally uses this atmosphere to support one of the film's primary themes, which we will come back to in more detail near the end of this video, a critique of indulging too heavily in nostalgia.
And before we move on, I'd like to highlight another aspect of the film's construction, which will become more important near the end of this video, and will play into the theme I just mentioned, the timeless aesthetic of this movie. Anderson's adaptation is technically set in 2008, when it was being produced. As eagle-eyed viewers can note from the cuvee dates on Bean's alcoholic cider bottles and the banners in the local newspaper. But, ignoring a few minor background details, it could just as easily be set in 1998, or 78, or even 58. Anderson deliberately mixes and matches fashion, technology, and architecture from different time periods in a way that gives the whole story an air of coming not from one specific time period, but rather having existed in some vague prior era the way our own nostalgic recollections of the past can blend and swirl together in a sort of haze, becoming simpler and more comforting as the rougher edges are smoothed out by the passage of time. But I'll come back to this more later. But even disregarding the broader messaging and anachronistic aesthetic, the careful craftsmanship on display serves to convey an underlying feeling of coziness by bringing the characters, and the world they inhabit, to life in a way that is surprisingly familiar and human. Just in this breakfast scene alone, there is a dynamism matching or even surpassing that of many live-action films in what is technically a mostly static long take, with Mr. Fox reading his newspaper and eating in the foreground, Mrs. Fox preparing her husband's breakfast in the midground before joining him in front of the camera, and Ash repeatedly entering and departing from the background as he gets ready for school. In doing so, the shot manages to capture the hustle and bustle of a real-life human household preparing for the day something most of us probably experienced in one form or another countless times in our own childhoods. Sure, the cast are really just stop-motion puppets of animals dressed in human clothing, but the visual filmmaking, coupled with Anderson and Baumbach's writing, manages to make the humanity of these characters not only believable, but undeniable. Through his direction, Wes treats the cast not as puppets, but as he would live-action actors, with the camera zooming in for dramatic line deliveries, taking time to focus on specific characters' facial expressions as we watch eyes water with tears or narrow in rage, as faces brighten or sink. I must have seen this movie several dozen times by now, and yet it never ceases to amaze me just how easy it is to understand what a character is feeling or thinking merely by looking at them, an effect complemented by the variety of gestures and quirks that Anderson imbues his characters with, and that the cast bring to their voice performances. Just looking for these careful touches in the breakfast scene alone, you have the autumn winds blowing dead leaves and rustling the grass as the paper boy rides by, the way Ash's right ear flicks when he's angry, and honestly this entire exchange. It never fails to make me smile. Honey, I'm seven non-fox years old now. My father died at seven and a half. I don't want to live in a hole anymore, and I'm going to do something about it. <laughs> Even the comedy takes full advantage of the movie's animated nature, giving us plenty of clever, creative visual gags that wouldn't quite work in live action. Don't worry, I've been stealing birds for a living since before I could trot. By the way, you look unbelievably beautiful tonight. You're practically glowing. Maybe it's the lighting. With the level of detail present throughout the film, it would be impossible to point out every single praiseworthy inclusion while maintaining a reasonable length for this video. But as we go on, I'll try to hit the highlights. Ignoring the advice of his wife, Mr. Fox then begins looking into purchasing a nicer house, first checking out a property with a real estate agent, played by Wes Anderson himself, and then speaking with his lawyer, voiced by Bill Murray. And in both cases, we see this movie's trademark blend of the relatable and human with the cartoonish and animal. When Mr. Fox and Stan Weasel inspect the property, itself built into a beach atop a hill, their voices echo in the cavernous interior, as the latter describes the tree like any human realtor would a house. Obviously it's first growth, indigenous, original dirt floor, good bark, skipping stone hearth as you can see. Here, we are introduced to Kylie, the building's super, in an interaction that, like so much else, just feels so real. Characters will cut each other off as something else draws their attention, or they get distracted or interrupted. They'll stumble over their lines in nervousness or uncertainty, and background conversations will bleed in and out of earshot. Also, Kylie is great. He's a little, uh... What's in the bucket, Mr. Kylie? See, you see what his eyes look like? Hey, Kylie? Kylie! Huh? Uh, uh, just minnows. Do you, uh, try one? Certainly, thank you. Additionally, Anderson and Baumbach's witty writing remains approachable to children while never treating its audience as less intelligent, 
leaving scenes reminiscent, at least in my view, of being a child overhearing an adult conversation. That's not exactly an evergreen, is it? Aren't there any pines on the market on this side of the river? But pines are pretty hard to come by in your price range. Don't buy this tree, Foxy. You're borrowing at nine and a half with no fixed rate, plus moving into the most dangerous neighborhood in the country for someone of your type of species. When Mr. Fox is inspecting the house, he cannot help but spot the three farmers' properties on hills in the distance, whereupon he stares wistfully at them before recalling his prior profession, pointing at the deeper desire lurking beneath his more mundane housing concerns, to relive his glorious past as a poultry thief. May I ask what you do for a living, Mr. Fox? I used to steal birds, but now I'm a newspaper man. Oh, sure, I've seen your byline. Mm. <laughs> and when Mr. Fox speaks with his lawyer, he shows further interest in the farmers, leading to the audience receiving a bit of humorous exposition lifted straight from Dahl's original book, complete with an adaptation of his poem in the form of a children's rhyme. Listen to this. The farmers who will serve as our film's antagonists are Walt Boggess, a morbidly obese chicken farmer who, according to Badger, eats three chickens every day for breakfast, lunch, supper, and dessert. That's 12 in total per diem. Nate Bunce, a diminutive, pot-bellied duck and goose farmer, and Frank Bean, the leader of the trio, a lean, luger-wielding, chain-smoking turkey and apple farmer who subsists solely on a diet of strong alcoholic cider. He's as skinny as a pencil, as smart as a whip, and possibly the scariest man currently living. And just to point out some nice little details, I love how Linda, Badger's secretary, is busily typing away in the background, and only slightly looks up when her boss and Mr. Fox begin growling and hissing at each other. The decorations in Badger's office, including a painting of a bunch of pioneers of his species, his and others' diplomas and certificates lining the walls, and the numerous sticky notes pasted on and around the computer and littering his desk serve to make the interior, like all of the other sets, feel so lived in. Also, the way their argument concludes will never cease to amuse me. Just by the tree. Okay. We are then treated to an energetic sequence of a moving company of squirrels helping to situate the Fox family in their new home, where every piece of every frame is bustling with activity, before getting a panning shot of the trio settling in. And I just love the dynamism in these scenes, and how familiar and inviting the final shot feels, with Mrs. Fox vacuuming, Ash reading a comic, and Mr. Fox surveying his new property. All right, we got two circuits here. We got the yellow circuit and the green circuit. Let's just keep them separated. Hold it right there. Now we need to bring about 2% more in. Good, here we go. A little bit more, a little bit more. We are then introduced to a new character, Christopherson Silver Fox, the son of Mrs. Fox's brother, who arrives to stay with the Fox family while his father is dealing with a case of double pneumonia. And I feel obligated to point out the World War II style unaccompanied minor tag he's wearing. For some reason, I always find that touch both endearing and amusing. In the following scene, the family lounges around outside, with Mr. Fox reading, his wife painting, and the two boys diving from a branch into a pool. And here, we begin to establish the dynamic between Ash and his cousin. In many ways, Christofferson is too good, naturally talented at almost everything from diving to sports to karate, intelligent, thoughtful, respectful, and moral, a perfect foil for his childish, insecure, clumsy cousin. He's the type of character that would likely be boring to follow, but who serves excellently as a light-hearted pseudo-antagonist for a much more flawed character. Christofferson is the kind of person we've all probably known at some point in our lives, the kind of person who is better than you at almost everything, and yet is gracious and humble about their superiority. Which, especially in the eyes of an immature child, can make them seem all the more insufferable. And he's even designed to stick out visually, with his silvery fur, light blue shirt, and bright yellow shoes deliberately clashing with the earthy, autumnal color palette of the rest of the cast and backgrounds. Ash and Christofferson's mostly one-sided rivalry, like so much else in this movie, just feels so human the kind of petty feud you yourself probably experienced as a child. I know I certainly did. Sometimes I swear these interactions were plucked straight from my own youthful memories. But this rivalry isn't just played for laughs. Their dynamic factors into the arcs of both Mr. Fox and his son. As I mentioned earlier, a central element of the story involves Mr. Fox's difficulty in accepting the loss of his past, 
as a result of which he has ended up projecting his own feelings of insecurity onto the son who is so different from him. But seeing as Mr. Fox's insecurities about his own nature remain with him even after attempting to fill the void, so to speak, with a nice new house, as evidenced by this line, Still painting thunderstorms, I see. Do you still feel poor? Less so. So too does his relationship with his son stay strained. Mr. Fox half-heartedly applauds Ash's clumsy dive while giving a bit of criticism, only to then be amazed at his nephew's talent, with Christofferson's humble response being contrasted against Ash's jealousy. And when Ash tries to ask his father if he sees him as an athlete, Mr. Fox is dismissive of his son's concerns. In response, Ash begins to take out his frustrations on his cousin, callously mentioning his uncle's sickness. And this little bit, like so much else in the movie, just feels so familiar, the kind of thing your own mother would have told you when bringing up a sensitive subject. How long is Christofferson supposed to stay with us? Until your uncle gets better. Right, but roughly how long do we plan to give him on that? Double pneumonia? Isn't really that big of a deal, is it? Lower your voice, Ash. From here, we come to a brief dialogue, mostly one-sided, between Mr. Fox and Kylie. As the two stand atop the former's house beneath the star-filled night sky, Mr. Fox confesses his insecurities to his new friend. Who am I, Kylie? Who how? What now? Why a fox? Why not a, a horse or a beetle or a bald eagle? I'm saying this more as, like, existentialism, you know? This right here cuts to the heart of Mr. Fox's journey through the film. As he himself asks, Who am I? And how can a fox ever be happy without, you'll forgive the expression, a chicken in its teeth? Of course, the conversation never becomes too bogged down in dour introspection, instead containing Anderson's trademark blend of natural awkward candor and dashes of humor. But in doing so, it manages to sound like the kind of talk you'd expect from real people discussing real anxieties they're still in the process of coming to understand, while also containing excellent moments of levity to break the tension. Who am I? And how can a fox ever be happy without a, uh, you'll forgive the expression, a chicken in its teeth? I don't know what you're talking about, but it sounds illegal. Here, put this bandit hat on. Over the next few scenes, Mr. Fox and Kylie plan and then enact heists of each of the three farmers' compounds in turn, fueling tensions within the Fox household as Mrs. Fox becomes more and more suspicious of her husband's activities. Meanwhile, Ash grows increasingly frustrated with his cousin as the two spar for the affections of a girl at school. The latter excels in his first try at the sport that Ash's own father was once a star player at, and Christofferson is later chosen by Mr. Fox for the final raid, while Ash himself is left out. A few little moments worth drawing attention to are Mr. Fox's snappy dialogue in the heist planning scene. I'm bringing you in as my secretary and personal assistant. Okay. This is actually kind of a big deal, so don't just say, okay. Okay, well, thank you. Which showcases both his wit and the more callous side of his personality, as well as his friend's humorous timidity. Beagles aren't so tough. Yeah? Well, first of all, one of these beagles has chronic rabies, which he's on medication for, and if you get bit by him, you have to get shots in your stomach for six months. And second, you, listen, I'm not going to justify this to you. Just pay attention and stop interrupting me. I'm taping this. The dossiers Mr. Fox has collected on the targets of their heist. How Christofferson remains polite even when Ash treats him horribly. Good night. <laughs> he's just so wholesome. Ash's reaction to realizing that his crush Agnes has been staring at Christofferson during their experiment in chemistry class. Potassium try. what are you looking at? Oh no. The awkward way the latter two flirt. Hmm, I like your ears. M my? Mm-hmm. Thank you. Oh, I like your spots. Really? I used to cover them up, but uh, you know. As well as Ash's final line in this scene. You're supposed to be my lab partner. I am. No, you're not. You're disloyal. The way Mr. Fox and Kylie end up sneaking into Bogus's farm. You know who could do this part easily is Christofferson. That kid's like a professional Olympic level. Why don't we run that way? There's no obstacles. Yeah, that's better. And even more so the way they escape. All right, what's the master escape plan? Follow me again. Mrs. Fox's subsequent reactions to finding their pantry filled with more and more food. <gasps> huh. <gasps> huh. 
Christofferson mastering the bizarrely complex sport of whack bat in an instant. Well, it's real simple. Basically, there's three grabbers, three taggers, five twig runners, and the player at whack bat. The center tagger lights a pine cone, chucks it over the basket, and the whack batter tries to hit the cedar stick off the cross rock. Then the twig runners dash back and forth until the pine cone burns out, and the umpire calls hot box. Got it. Go in for ash. The way Mr. Fox comically excuses himself and Kylie from dinner. I'm supposed to cover this book party at some animal's nest in a tobacco field down the hill. So me and Kylie are going to hop over there and give it a whirl. Don't wait up. What's the book? Some memoir. I'll get him to sign you a copy. Mr. Fox rejecting Ash when he tags along on the third heist, while having asked for his cousin to come. I want to help you steal some cider. We're going to a book party and keep your mouth shut about any cider because no one ever said that. Now get out of here. But, uh, but nothing. You're going to get me in a lot of trouble. Besides, you're too little and uncoordinated. Uh, there's another one. Ah, uh, oh, good. You made it. Anybody see you? I don't think so. Here, put this bandit hat on. And really, just the entirety of the third heist, which takes place in Bean's secret cider cellar. The set is constructed almost like a cathedral, with amber bottles stacked toward the vaulted ceiling, catching and reflecting the lighting and casting everything in a golden hue. Here, the three encounter Rat, a switchblade-wielding former partner in crime of Mr. Fox, voiced by a gruff southern accent affecting Willem Dafoe. Y'all are trespassing now. Illegally. The whole back and forth between Rat and the intruders is just so deliciously slick. Is that true? Of course not. I mean, certainly she lived. We all did. It was a different time. Let's not use a double standard. She marched against the But town tart? Shut up. And the entire scene is set to a wonderful Western showdown-inspired score with a country twist, complete with banjos, whistling, and pipes almost like if the music from Deliverance were composed by Ennio Morricone. As for little details, I love the way Rat draws his knife, Kylie's reaction, and Christofferson's characteristic response to their not being spotted when Bean's wife comes into the cellar. Oh my gosh! I is she blind? I think she might have astigmatism, or possibly a cataract of some form. Uh, anyway, her eyes don't see well. Also, this shot of Bean at the top of the stairs really helps to build up his menace as the primary antagonist. And speaking of antagonists, we then cut from the thieves making their escape to an emergency meeting of the three farmers, with a staging taken straight from a 60s spy thriller. The trio meet in a dimly lit warehouse, sitting across from one another on mismatched chairs, with Bean, the ringleader, clutching a glass of alcohol in one hand and dragging on a cigarette with the other, backlit by one of the dingy work lights. After a bit of English chit-chat, Bean then whips out his Luger and shoots out all of the lights for dramatic effect, before announcing that he plans to Camp in the bushes, wait for him to come out of the hole in his tree, and shoot the castle smithereens. Something else about this movie that bears mentioning here is that, despite being quote-unquote appropriate for younger audiences, the film retains a degree of edginess not commonly found in family-friendly Western media. Those farmers aren't going to quit until they've got you and every member of your family nailed upside down to a bloody stick with your eyes gorged out. This is getting a little too personal. Characters smoke and drink, the villains use actual guns, and people can be not only maimed, but killed. Something we receive our first taste of in the following scene. Mrs. Fox catches the three returning home from their heist, and we get what might be the funniest line in the entire movie. If what I think is happening is happening, it better not be. Honestly, all of the comedy in this scene is absolute gold. Thanks, Kylie. Why is he wearing that bandit hat? His ears were cold. He's not with us. Go back to bed. Mr. Fox and Kylie then emerge above ground, only to be ambushed by the trio of farmers, who manage to shoot the former's tail off. All three! Kill him! We got the tail, but we missed the fox. As Mrs. Fox tends to her husband's wounds, Ash, Still spiteful over not being brought along, callously brings up Christofferson's father's sickness, giving us perhaps the most politely passive-aggressive moment in movie history. I mean, his dad's got one foot in the grave and three feet on a banana peel. It's a lot worse than just a... Excuse me, everyone. I'm going to go meditate for half an hour. Also, Mrs. Fox's reaction is priceless. You have got 29 minutes to come up with a proper apology. But the family hasn't gotten off that easy. 
as they learn later that night when the farmers began digging them out of their home. And despite the whimsical tone that permeates much of this movie, I think the expressiveness of the puppets does an excellent job of conveying their fear in the film's tenser scenes, and in doing so provides a sense of genuine danger. The four foxes and Kylie tunnel into the earth, evading the farmer's clutches in a sequence that grows more and more comically exaggerated over time, with the animals digging ever deeper as their foes utilize increasingly sophisticated and expensive equipment. And it is during this section of the movie that Mr. Fox is first confronted with his failure to keep the promise he made to his wife in the opening, and gradually comes to recognize that his thrill-seeking, nostalgia-obsessed actions have consequences for those around him. It would be genuinely difficult for me to name one particular scene from this movie as my favorite. The showdown in the cider cellar, the hilarious campfire song Petey sings, the conversation between Mr. and Mrs. Fox that occurs before the final confrontation, the shootout at Bean's farm, and the famous Conus Lupus scene are all certainly contenders, but one of the scenes right here ranks among their number. An angry Mrs. Fox leads her husband into a side cavern stunningly lit by shimmering crystals, where she berates him for breaking his promise to her. Twelve fox years ago, you made a promise to me, while we were caged inside that fox trap, that if we survived, you would never steal another chicken, turkey, goose, duck, or squab, whatever they are. And I believed you. Why? Why did you lie to me? And the only answer Mr. Fox can give is an appeal to his quote-unquote true nature, a justification that even he doesn't seem quite so sure of anymore. Because I'm a wild animal. When his wife points this out to him, You are also a husband and a father. Appealing to his responsibilities over some abstract pursuit of his inner nature, the only response he has left is, I'm trying to tell you the truth about myself. But that is exactly Mrs. Fox's point, and the writer's as well. Mr. Fox shouldn't be valuing some internalized conception of his true nature that might not even be accurate over the people around him, the people who rely on him and care about him. No one should. As Mrs. Fox says at the end of this scene, This story is too predictable. Predictable, really? What happens in the end? In the end, we all die. Unless you change. It is a plea to her husband to let go of his past, or at the very least, to not let his personal burdens drag everyone else down with him. I adore this scene, and I think it perfectly encapsulates everything that makes Wes Anderson's style so brilliant and impactful and unique. Not only does he manage to blend narrative drama with bits of levity in a way that cheapens neither, but rather elevates both in matching the clumsy way serious conversations often play out in real life, but his attention to visual detail shines through the scene, quite literally, as the light glittering off of the backdrop of crystals sparkles in Mrs. Fox's tears. Throughout it all, the camera draws nearer and nearer to the characters with each successive cut between them, increasing the sense of intimacy and allowing us to look the two in the eyes, just as they are doing to one another, before cutting to a side shot when Mrs. Fox leaves. And all the while, André de Plas's soft, twinkling strings evince the tenderness of the moment. I hope that doesn't sound too pretentious, but I just find it remarkable that this movie made with stop-motion animal puppets can feel so decidedly human. At the same time, Wes's careful use of humor never lets the movie feel too heavy, even when tackling such impactful subject matter. Just look at the next scene, where the farmers inspect some of Mrs. Fox's thunderstorm paintings as they stand in the rubble of the family's home. By the way, this is an excellent use of the Rolling Stones' Street Fighting Man. <laughs> While Mr. Fox has been set on the path to recognizing his mistakes, and the broader personal flaws that led to them, he still remains callous and dismissive towards others, and clings to the old way of doing things. As the five flee from the farmer's tractors, he gives his son a backhanded apology, comparing Ash unfavorably with his cousin. I understand if you are, and I'm sorry, I wouldn't have ever involved your cousin if I'd realized you'd feel this way. It was only ever just because he's kind of a natural. I mean, I mean, look at him dead! And when the group meet up with the other animals of their community, discovering that their neighbors have all been driven underground by the farmer's vendetta, Mr. Fox cannot help but retain his attitude of smug self-centeredness. I just want to see a little sunshine. But you're nocturnal, Phil. Your eyes barely even open on a good day. I'm sick of your double talk! We have rights! 
This plays into something I've mentioned several times by now, how Wes Anderson and Noah Baumbach's writing manages to make these characters feel like real people. We've all probably known someone like Mr. Fox at some point in our lives, someone who is witty and talented and charming, with a forceful personality and a degree of competence that allow them to get away with a high level of egotism. He's arrogant and callous without being truly malicious, seemingly unconcerned with or even incapable of recognizing when he is being rude or hurtful. Just look how he responds to his son's insecurities when comparing Ash to his cousin. Plus he knows karate. Or how, after winning a short-lived victory against the farmers, he steals Badger's thunder when his more mild-mannered friend tries to make a toast in his own home. But I guess we have- I'm sorry, maybe my invitation got lost in the mail. Does anybody know what this Badger's talking about? <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 but Clive's right, in all seriousness. Excuse me, B. I guess we do have the- You can't really blame Clyde for getting this little jab in. I can imagine how painful, even just emotionally, that must be for you. Well, you know, it's not the end of the world. Oh, but Foxy, how humiliating, having your whole tail blown clean off Can we drop it? But the reason I find Mr. Fox to be such a compelling protagonist is precisely because of his flawed nature. Because he feels believable in a way that even many live-action flesh-and-blood characters fail to. He isn't a horrible person. He's a man, or fox in this case, battling with deep-seated, relatable insecurities, with a personality that leads him to inadvertently make things worse for those around him. Likewise, his wife's attempts to steer him away from this destructive path, and gradually growing frustration with his impulsive decisions, remain decidedly believable, as does the way his son childishly lashes out in anger against the cousin he knows is too polite to stoop to his level as do Christofferson's attempts to balance standing up for himself with refusing to escalate the tensions between them. I don't have beagle ticks, by the way. Well, uh, me neither. Whoever said we had beagle ticks, by the way? Apparently that's what you've been telling everyone. Beagle ticks and pelt lice. I never said that, and you're misquoting me. Or somebody is, but I'm gonna get to the bottom of it. And, side note, I know I've said it before, but Christofferson is just so wholesome. Look, Ash, we may or may not ever see the light of day again, but I really like Agnes, and I think she likes me. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, great. Well, she's a free agent. What do I care? Well, then why are you dead set on- Can I ask you a question? You may. The fact that he still stands up for Ash after everything his cousin has said and done is so endearing. Don't do that. Why'd you take your shoes off? So I don't break your nose when I kick it. Unlike with Mr. Fox, the way Christofferson corrects Ash so matter-of-factly is completely devoid of any malice or even snark. I can fight my own fights. No, you can't. And the two continue to play off each other perfectly, such as with this little bit, after Ash rudely drives Christofferson's girlfriend away to discuss a plan to steal back his dad's tail. Was I a bit rude to Agnes? Yeah. I should probably say something, shouldn't I? I'll say something in a minute. Also, my goodness are the farmer's attempts to root the foxes out just hilariously over the top. Stand clear, please. Stand clear, everyone. Contact! Boggis, how many men have you got working on your farm? 35. Months? 36. I've got 37. That's 1, 3, 3, 4, 4, 5, 2, 5, 2, 2, 2. That's 108 altogether. And Bean's innocent, banjo-toting henchman Petey definitely deserves a mention. Voiced by Jarvis Cocker, and designed as a John Lennon look-alike, Petey only has a handful of lines in total, but he gets one of the funniest moments in the entire film. He and a bunch of reporters and farmhands gather around a campfire at night, singing a ballad celebrating Mr. Fox's trickery. And partway through, their boss cuts the song short and asks what they're doing, whereupon we get this great little bit of banter. What are you singing, Petey? Just, just making it up as I, as I went along, really. That's just weak songwriting. You wrote a bad song, Petey. I especially love the character-filled touch of having Bean angrily flick his cigarette at Petey before disappearing back into the darkness. Anyway, back to the plot. The trapped animals reluctantly agree to follow Mr. Fox's lead when he announces that he has a plan to save them. But despite it being his nostalgia-filled attempts to relive his youth that got their community into this mess in the first place, Mr. Fox's proposed solution is to double down with an even more impressive heist. After stealing as much as they can from the farmers, 
We took everything. They took everything? Let me call you back, Petey. The animals hold a banquet underground to celebrate their supposed victory. And it's worth noting that this is actually how the novel ends, with the animals lauding the triumphant Mr. Fox for his grandest trick, as the oblivious farmers sit above ground, waiting futilely for the animals to give up. But such a clean ending wouldn't befit the explorations of character and theme that Anderson and Baumbach have so carefully planned. In fact, in the movie, we're only slightly past the halfway point. As the animal community gathers around for a feast, an inebriated Mr. Fox ironically still sees things in terms of his past, in terms of winning and having beaten the farmers, rather than truly caring about providing for those around him. Now, I've already had too much to drink, and I'm feeling sentimental, but I'm going to say something anyway, which nobody wants to admit, but I think is probably true. We beat him. Even after all the damage he's done to his family and community, it's all still just a game to him. Ironic, given that he professes the importance of being thankful and aware of each other, while remaining ignorant to the fact that his son and nephew have embarked on an ill-advised mission to recover his severed tail and failing to recognize that the only reason the animals are in this situation in the first place is because he wasn't satisfied with the blessings he already had in life, and foolishly sought to reclaim the glory of his vanished youth. And this is precisely when a cold dose of the reality he has been ignoring comes flooding down, in the form of gallon upon gallon of cider that the farmers have decided to weaponize. Sure, it's done in a deliberately comical manner, I mean, it's a literal flood of alcoholic cider being pumped into the tunnels with fire hoses, but it's also proof that things aren't as easy as Mr. Fox thought. This isn't the simple days of his youth, where pitting his wits against the farmers was a necessity, or at the very least only endangered himself. As a father and husband, his actions have consequences for those around him, and his attempts to rely on the old ways to win have only made things worse for everyone. And it is at this moment that, Looking for his son and nephew in a panic after the flood deposits the animals in the sewer system beneath the local human town, Mr. Fox learns that Christofferson has been captured by the farmers. The shock on his face and choked line delivery from Clooney really sell the despair of his realization. Not only that he has endangered the life of a family member, but that all of this is ultimately his fault. You still think we beat him, Foxy? And here we get another of my favorite scenes, the second heart-to-heart -heart between Mr. Fox and his wife. As the two stand in a darkened sewer tunnel, the scene backlit by a glistening waterfall, Mr. Fox admits his failure, acknowledges the roots of his insecurities, and finally comes to the surprisingly mature and selfless conclusion that sacrificing himself to appease the farmer's bloodlust is the other's best hope for survival. Maybe if I hand myself over and let them kill me, stuff me, and hang me over their mantle. You'll do no such thing. Darling, maybe they'll let everyone else live. Oh, why'd you have to get us into this, Foxy? The way Meryl Streep's voice breaks slightly as she says that line always gets me, as does what the two say to each other in what both believe will be their final moment together. I promise you if I had all this to do over again, I'd have never let you down. It was always more fun when we did it together anyway. I love you, Felicity. I love you too. But I shouldn't have married you. The last person Mr. Fox goes to talk to before embarking on his sacrificial suicide mission is his son, Ash, the boy who has long lived a troubled life in the shadow of his famous father. Here, Mr. Fox chooses to recount the story of when he and Ash's mother escaped from the trap at the beginning of the film, and how he had found himself wondering what their child would turn out to be like, concluding with the line, Ash, I'm so glad he was you. It's not your fault. It's mine. Such a simple line, and yet it manages to carry so much weight. At once a declaration of his love and a recognition of his own enduring failure to be the father his son needed. On the surface, this seems to be referencing Christofferson's capture, but it can just as easily be taken as an apology for all of the mistakes made in their relationship. An admission that Ash's flaws, his outcast status and irritability and immaturity are ultimately his father's responsibility. However, just after Mr. Fox leaves to surrender himself to the farmers, the other animals stumble upon Rat. The knife-wielding rodent offers them a trade on behalf of his bosses, 
who believe they have captured Mr. Fox's son and wish to exchange the boy for his father. As always, we get great bits of levity to lighten the tension. Why'd they write this in letters cut out of magazines? To protect their identities. Oh, right, but then why'd they sign their names? Plus we already knew who they were because they're trying to kill us. But when Rat realizes that the farmers captured the wrong fox, he attempts to correct the mistake, only for Ash's father to return in the nick of time and fatally wound his former partner. Excuse me, may I cut in? Before dying, Rat reveals where Christofferson is being held as a final gesture of goodwill towards his old friend. And though the scene is replete with classic Anderson-style dialogue, The boy's locked in an apple crate on top of a gun locker in the attic of Bean Annex. Would you have told me if I didn't kill you first? Never. Rat's death is handled with surprising reverence with soft glockenspiel notes ringing over a somber orchestral score as the animals gather around their dying foe before tenderly laying his body in the water and watching as the current carries it away. In a sense, this scene symbolically represents Mr. Fox's internal growth, in that by killing his former partner, Mr. Fox has killed a part of himself as well, the short-sighted, impulsive, pleasure-seeking vestige of his youth, the part of him that has made everything worse by indulging, as Rat's final words suggest, he only ever really cared about superficial pleasure, just like the immature part of Mr. Fox. All these wasted years, what were you looking for, Rat? He's trying to say something, Dad. Slider. But in allowing this old part of himself to die, he receives a new chance to set things right with a true final heist. Not to simply humiliate the farmers or indulge his youthful fantasies, but to rescue his captured nephew and ensure the safety of his family and friends. Over the course of the next few scenes, Mr. Fox rallies his community with an inspiring speech about their animal natures, then escapes through the farmer's blockade with Kylie and Ash, infiltrates Bean's compound and frees his nephew before returning to the new home the animals have made for themselves in the sewers beneath the town. And here, I'll hit the highlights before circling back around for the more substantive discussions. I love the weird little speech Mr. Fox gives, set to the Beach Boys' I Get Around, where he lists his various neighbors' Latin species names and traits. Linda, Lutra Lutra, Mole, Talpa Europea, Rabbit, Oryctolagus Canicula, Beaver, Castor Fiber, Badger, Melis Melis, Weasel, Mustela Navarra, Stop Yelling! Oh, all right, good, fabulous, Microtus Pennsylvanicus. <laughs> Only to skip Kylie and then give this answer as to why. Listen, you're Kylie. You're an unbelievably nice guy. Your job is really just to be available, I think. I don't know your Latin name. I doubt they even had opossums in ancient Rome. Fun fact, this scene actually helped me ace a vertebrate anatomy exam in college. So thanks, Wes. I love how we get another Western-style showdown, this time in the town square. I don't trust this guy. Anyway, set up the ambush. With the farm workers packing an absurd amount of heat, especially for Britain. Where did that guy get an AK? And I love how Deplas's score utilizes an English children's chorus singing Dahl's rhyme about the three farmers. What the cuss is he burning? I love how Mrs. Fox uses her painting skills to chart the strikes of flaming pine cones on the farmer's defenses after creating a detailed portrait of the terrain, and how Rabbit whispers a prayer to the Virgin Mary before sprinting through gunfire. Decoy phase, go! Yes, sir! I love how when Mr. Fox and Kylie run up to the human motorcycle shop, there's a tiny version of this normal bike right behind it. And how when they infiltrate Bean's compound, the trio run into the rabid beagle that was set up near the beginning of the movie. I love everything in the dialogue between Ash and Christofferson. From the latter's initial reaction, I've got mixed feelings about that. To the way he just as quickly shifts into giving his cousin a karate lesson. Now for a rudimentary version of the cyclone chop. First, need to get a running start, which obviously I can't do in here. Then, as you arrive at the destination of the chop, lean and thrust into the point of contact. Paw remains open and straight, then withdraw instantaneously. Remember, it's the pullback that matters. The pullback generates the force of the impact. To how, after Ash issues his heartfelt apology, he is immediately forgiven. Chris Arverson, I'm sorry. 
Well, that's all right, too. Throw me the shoelace, please. And I absolutely love the final confrontation between Mr. Fox and Frank Bean. When the human posse corners the four animals in the courtyard, Mr. Fox gives this dramatic little monologue, defiantly condemning the farmers for everything they have done. Your tractors uprooted my tree. Your posse hunted my family. Your gunmen kidnapped my nephew. Your rat insulted my wife, and you shot off my tail. I'm not leaving here without that necktie. And after all this tense, dramatic buildup, with the heroes and villains staring each other down across the courtyard, the movie immediately cuts to this. Kill him! Actually, we should just go. Where'd I park? Classic Wes Anderson. Ash manages to run through a hail of fire and set the rabid beagle free, giving the four a chance to escape, at which point Mr. Fox recognizes his son's ability, declaring him to be a real athlete. And the look of quiet acceptance Ash gives to the camera shows how much he's grown. Also, I never fail to find this moment hysterically funny. <laughs> And I love how Christofferson thinks to save the tail as they drive past it. After escaping the compound, the four then come across a wolf. Don't worry, I'll come back to this in just a moment, before returning to the sewers, where their community is beginning to settle in despite the hardships posed by the change in scenery. Finally, the movie ends with Mr. Fox leading his family on a raid of the town supermarket, which happens to be a joint venture between Boggus, Bunce, and Bean. Now, about that wolf scene. Upon one's first viewing, it can be pretty confusing, to put it bluntly. In fact, many viewers describe this scene as feeling out of place, or coming out of nowhere, a sentiment so widespread that apparently Wes himself had to fight to keep it from getting cut from the film entirely. But in his own words, this scene contains the entire reason he made the movie. And I'm fully ready to admit that I might be looking into this a little too deeply, but then again, Wes Anderson is known for painstaking attention to detail. On their way back from breaking Christofferson out of Bean's compound, the four stop their motorcycle when Kylie spots a wolf in the distance, and a perplexed Mr. Fox tries to communicate with it. Where'd he come from? Where'd you come from? What are you doing here? The reality the wolf inhabits appears almost entirely separate from that of the rest of the film, a slice of wintry, pristine wilderness shoved into the autumnal English countryside. And when Mr. Fox's English entreaties and Latin name identifications fail to elicit a reaction, he switches to speaking French, often viewed within upper-crust English circles as a sign of sophistication, fitting in with Mr. Fox's charming and cultured self-image. I'm asking if he thinks we're in for a hard winter. He doesn't seem to know. But it's important to take note of what he asks the wolf. Are we in for a harsh winter? The Four Seasons have a long history in cultures around the world of being associated with the differing stages of life. The blossoming of spring with birth and childhood, the sun-filled heights of summer with the prime of one's life, the cool decay of autumn with middle age, and the bitter, quiet chill of winter with senescence and death. In a similar fashion, I believe that the Conus Lupus scene represents Mr. Fox's confrontation with his own mortality, the winter whose chill he feels steadily approaching as the years march on, whose advance he had hoped to shelter or distract himself from by reliving the happy days of his youth. I opened my video on Watership Down and the Plague Dogs with a Tolkien quote that I feel bears repeating, or at least paraphrasing, here. The most enduring stories all share a central element in their confrontation with death. Above all else, it is the one experience common to every one of us. No matter who you are, rich or poor, strong or weak, brilliant or dull, talented or mundane, good or evil, you will not last forever. This, too, shall pass. 
Often, those with a heightened awareness of their own mortality cope in one of two ways, looking either to the future in the hopes of securing a lasting legacy, or to the past in relishing their idealized youth, or regretting choices made or opportunities missed that have long since been forgotten by others. But while there is nothing wrong with planning ahead or reflecting on the past, the problem is that an undue focus on either can lead to us ignoring the present, squandering the limited and ever-dwindling time we have here and now with those around us. As Mrs. Fox dramatically states shortly after the destruction of their home, when Mr. Fox's metaphorical chickens first began coming home to roost, In the end, we all die. Unless you change. In its most extreme form, this behavior can be destructive to not only ourselves but those around us. But even in its milder, far more common incarnations, this mindset can still be damaging. There's a quote from A Song of Ice and Fire that bears mentioning here. He who rushes through life rushes to his own grave. And this movie adds a sort of addendum. He who clings to his past will miss his present, and jeopardize his future. I believe that the Conus Lupus scene in particular represents a twofold acceptance on Mr. Fox's part. That the person he is need not be defined by the idealized, wild archetype he and his society have molded for him, that it is okay to not embrace his quote-unquote true nature as a quote-unquote wild animal, whatever that means and however accurate that is, and that while he finds himself in the second half of his life, and autumn will inevitably give way to winter, there are things, and people, around him more worthy of his attention here and now. In the end, Mr. Fox's acceptance of his present domestic state and relinquishing of his fully wild past seems, at least in my eyes, to further explain why it was that Wes Anderson chose this particular Roald Dahl book to adapt into a story with these themes. The fox is easily one of the most iconic and celebrated animals in countless cultures across the globe, not only because of its aesthetic qualities and cunning nature, but because it exists in a strange, uneasy middle ground between civilization and the wilderness and between our own past and present. As I discussed in greater detail in my video on the history of Reynard the Fox, medieval Europe's archetypal folkloric trickster, despite possessing a familiar candid form, the fox has neither the dependent loyalty of the dog nor the defiant ferocity of the wolf. It is neither fully tame nor fully wild, surviving in humanity's shadow, haunting our footsteps a little piece of the primal wilderness from which we emerged, dwelling in the heart of the civilization we have so painstakingly erected as protection against that past. Mr. Fox himself admits, Foxes traditionally like to court danger, hunt prey, and outsmart predators, and that's what I'm actually good at. I think at the end of the day, I'm just... I know. We're wild animals. <laughs> I guess we always were. But throughout the film, Despite professing and pursuing a deep desire to embrace his wild nature, the titular character admits to having a phobia of wolves, representing how he finds himself torn between two paths, the wild, primal existence he believes is natural to him, and the tame, civilized version that the demands of maturity and providing for a family have forced him to embrace. Like his real-life wild namesake, Mr. Fox straddles the line between man and beast, and in the end, he is forced to recognize that, like humanity at large, he can never truly go back to that more primitive state, though he can still derive strength from it. Mr. Fox was first directly confronted with this uncomfortable truth by his wife in the crystal-studded cave when their home was destroyed, and later recognized it for himself in the darkness of the sewer tunnel when he confessed his failings and insecurities. But it is not until this point, standing on the fringes of the wilderness, staring down a real wild animal, that he is able to make peace with it. In the end, Mr. Fox does not follow the wolf back into the depths of the forest, or even converse with it, but merely exchanges a brief sign of solidarity, sharing a moment of wordless mutual understanding with his primal counterpart before the two go their separate ways forever. The most important takeaway here is that while a fox is what he is, it isn't who he is, and though his background may certainly have influenced his personality and actions, it doesn't need to define them. What a beautiful creature. Wish him luck, boys. Good luck, to you. Good, luck. Good luck out there. Now, before we wrap up this thematic discussion, I'd like to briefly detour into why I think this movie encapsulates the spirit of Thanksgiving, 
and to do so, I'm going to borrow a concept from another YouTuber. While my two favorite videos of his are probably the ones covering Treasure Planet and Robin Hood, in his retrospective on the Black Cauldron, Breadsword establishes a sort of holiday movie test, in that case for Halloween, coming up with a list of criteria for what constitutes a quote-unquote Halloween movie, provided a film checks three of five boxes. It's a concept I really like, so much so, in fact, that I'm going to take some inspiration from a certain charming poultry thief and steal it. To me, for a movie to be considered a Thanksgiving film, it should meet at least three of these five criteria. Being set in the season of autumn, featuring an autumnal color palette or aesthetic, containing a feast or banquet, including a coming together of different groups of people or setting aside of hostilities, and having a prominent focus on themes of thankfulness and community. While the case could certainly be made for Fantastic Mr. Fox also being an excellent Father's Day film, what with its themes of fatherhood, putting aside one's immature past, and responsibly providing for a household, it also checks most of these five boxes. Set in autumn? Actually, no. The movie takes place in May for some reason. That being said, pretty much every single scene is saturated in the aesthetics of autumn. And what about a feast or banquet? You bet. The dining hall is even adorned with harvest decorations. A coming together of different groups of people, and or setting aside of hostilities? Present on both counts. And, arguably most important, a prominent focus on themes of thankfulness and community? Why, that sets us up for a perfect segue. Mr. Fox begins this movie with a life full of blessings he takes for granted. A wife and son, a steady job to support them, and a home of their own. But instead of being contented with these blessings, as his wife suggests, or even working productively to better himself and his family, he instead resorts to recklessly trying to relive his idealized past, a course of action that only serves to render everyone in his life worse off. Earlier in this video, I referenced the timeless quality of this movie, and I think this aspect is fundamental to Anderson's critique of reveling in nostalgia. Fantastic Mr. Fox is deliberately and thoroughly anachronistic. The soundtrack's use of the Beach Boys and Burl Ives harkens back to the 50s and 60s, while classics of folk Americana, such as The Ballad of Davy Crockett, the song the film opens with, reach back further still. Sets are decorated with vintage electronic equipment, while Badger's office is a mishmash of time periods spanning from the 70s to the early 2000s, with sticky notes, a tape recorder, 90s computers, and a rustic frontier painting. Both the human and animal characters dress predominantly in 70s fashion, while the cars, trucks, and helicopters all likewise date to well before the movie's ostensible setting of 2008. Mr. Fox owns a Walkman, smokes a pipe, and reads the newspaper, which is delivered by a bike-riding paperboy, while his son reads a pulp comic and his wife uses an old-fashioned vacuum cleaner, even as the clock in Ash's room and the watches the animals wear are digital. All of this anachronism serves a distinct thematic purpose, divorcing the setting of the movie from any specific time period in a manner very similar to how our own nostalgic recollections work. In reality, when we long for a bygone era, we don't simply remember a better time. Instead, we reinvent one in our minds, cobbling together pieces of different past eras and events, altering and omitting, shifting the order of occurrences, and even outright fabricating. Human memory is not an infallible recollection, like a video file being played. It is an active process that changes each time it is accessed. In a sense, we rewrite our memories, even if only very subtly, every time we remember anything. And as the years accumulate, we ignore or minimize flaws, forget hardships, and allow the positive qualities of the past to grow larger and larger with each retelling, until the present and future can never hope to compete because the present remains imperfect, and the future uncertain, in a way the past never has to. I can even say from first-hand experience that several times now, upon having a memory be triggered by hearing a certain song or smelling a particular scent I hadn't encountered in a while, I have caught myself feeling a flash of nostalgia for prior times in my life that I know for a fact I was much less happy in than I am now. Memory can be deceptive that way. Perhaps the strongest incarnation of Wes Anderson's commentary on nostalgia comes in the form of the alcoholic apple cider that plays such a prominent role throughout the film. Like nostalgia, cider is warm and comforting, 
frequently associated with holiday gatherings and cherished family memories, but it is also intoxicating and addictive. Mr. Fox's grand plan to relive his glory days culminates specifically in a heist of cider, and it is here that he meets his former partner, Rat, who never really moved on from their past, still lurking in Bean's basement while Fox himself settled down and started a family, and still hopelessly addicted to that melted gold. When Mr. Fox's recklessness comes back to bite him, the consequences of indulging too heavily in nostalgia chasing take the form of a literal flood of cider, and later on, when he kills Rat to defend his family, the dying rodent's final wish is for nothing more than one last taste of the substance he had grown utterly dependent on. Here you are, Rat. A beaker of beans' finest secret cider. Black, melted gold. But while Anderson is critical of over-reliance on nostalgia through this motif, he does not entirely condemn cherishing the past, as demonstrated in the final scene, where rather than once more choosing to drink cider as they toast to their blessings, Mr. Fox and his companions settle for its watered-down form of apple juice, something that still retains a taste of cider's nostalgic comfort without being quite so overwhelming. Except Ash, of course. He drinks grape juice, because he's… different. I know it may seem ironic for a movie that drapes itself so heavily in the cozy trappings of nostalgia to simultaneously be so critical of it, but this paradoxical aspect is precisely what allows the message to carry so much weight. By the movie's end, everyone is worse off for Mr. Fox's indulging of his nostalgic pursuits, having lost their homes, businesses, and property, and been driven into the sewers, forced to evade gunmen and survive on scraps. But in spite of all this, their community resolves to make the most of what they do have. This optimistic vision is reflected in Mrs. Fox's announcement that she is once again pregnant, that despite having lost so much, the characters still have a present and future worth caring about and protecting. After the group raids the supermarket, Mr. Fox gives a wonderfully idiosyncratic speech about being thankful for what he has, ending with the statement, I guess my point is, we'll eat tonight and we'll eat together, and even in this not particularly flattering light, you are without a doubt the five and a half most wonderful wild animals I've ever met in my life." In doing so, he isn't ignoring the hardships of the present, but rather choosing to focus a little more on the positive, to remind himself and his family and friends of the blessings in their lives, however small or fleeting they may be. There will always be difficulty and suffering in life. But as a wise man once said, the evil of a day is sufficient unto itself. Look for reasons to be miserable, and you will never fail to find them. But look for reasons to be thankful, and you just might be pleasantly surprised. Nothing lasts forever. But, in a way, that finite nature is what makes anything meaningful in the first place. And while it is impossible to recapture the happiness of times long past, you never know what new positive experiences might be waiting for you on the horizon. They say our tree may never grow back, but one day something will. And there's something kind of fantastic about that. While we can always cherish the past, it is important to be able to let go of it, to not let it unduly weigh us down or distract us from the present. And while there is nothing wrong with reminiscing on prior joys or planning for the future, Life will always be here and now, in our choices and actions, in the people we care about, and who care about us. And that, I think, is the message that lies at the heart of this movie. It sounds so simple, and yet it can be so easy to forget, but it can make a world of difference to remember. And that is why, among many, many other things, I am thankful for Fantastic Mr. Fox.
Last night I drove to Harper's Ferry and I thought about you. There were signs on the roads that warned me of stop signs. The speed limit. Oh. You see, Peasy. Just, just making it up as I as I went along, really. That's just weak songwriting. <laughs> You have got 29 minutes to come up with a proper apology. Me? Me have an apology? He gets a grip. He just got here, he got a grip. Where's my grip?